Hello and good evening. Uh, welcome. My name is Ben Wilder, Director of the Desert Laboratory in Tumamakil, and welcome to our fall lecture series, Tumamakil Health, Community, and Nature in a New Era. I'm speaking to you from Tumamakil, known in Atam as Chimamagi Duak, Horn Lizard Mountain, on the ancestral lands of the Savaipri and Don Atam peoples. This volcanic hill is of prominent ancestral, cultural, and sacred significance to the Atam nations, including the Don Atam Nation, Gila River Indian Community, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, the Akchin Indian Community, as well as the Hopi tribe and the Pasco Yaqui tribe. The Desert Laboratory recognizes the cultural and significance of Chimamagi Duag as the bedrock of our institution and our future actions. So it's great that you were able to join us this evening um, for the kickoff of a really important lecture series we're starting um, that really where it came from was thinking so much about um, what's been really clear to me over the recent months is, and this has been very clear for a long time, but it's really crystallized, is that important role that Tumamak Hill has and continues to play in the lives of so many, um, especially since the pandemic began. So since March 2020, the number of people walking the hill really not only has it uh, not decreased, but actually we've seen some of our peak walking volumes. And mind you, this is despite for many months, the requirement to wear a mask for public self health safety reasons up and down the hill as you kind of climb this 800 foot mountain, uh, not making the climb any easier. Uh, and I think that this uh, dedication and this number of people we continue to see walk the hill speaks both to the connection um, held between people and this space, uh, but also to the larger role of community, health, and nature in these current times. Um, and that's really what we're going to be kind of focusing in this lecture series. And so when I say a, a new era, what I really am talking about is an age of uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty driven by the pandemic, uncertainty driven by climate change and climate extremes. Uh, just for example, the verdant summer we're experiencing right now, uh, likely Tucson's wettest on record, really comes on the heels immediately of the summer of 2020, or the non-soon, essentially the driest uh, summer on record. So these dramatic extremes from one year to the next is uh, likely going to be uh, continued to be the trajectory of the future. Um, and there's also uncertainty driven by great polarization and a trending to social extremes. However, there are core and relevant themes that are anchored by how we act and interact with Tuamak Hill. Uh, and really, uh, so much that can be learned from the confluence of culture, science, and community here on these slopes. So there, there really is an enrichment that happens when one is here. Um, the, those that have walked the hill regularly know, I feel it having the great fortune to work here uh, day in, day out that this space um, is so much more than the sums of its parts and, and has so much resonance on, on many different layers. Um, and really it's that enrichment that is so needed as we collectively proceed into this age of uncertainty. So this series takes several different approaches um, and, and really different angles at looking at these themes and narratives. Uh, tonight we're gonna be kind of kicked off uh, by a fantastic conversation which I'll get into more in a second. I was really going to do an overall uh, uh, addressing some of the many things we'll be getting into in the subsequent month. Next month, we are joined by Chairman of the Donna Atam Nation, Ned Norris Jr., who uh, is an avid hill walker himself and, um, and has so much knowledge and connection to this space on so many different levels. Uh, so we're very honored to have him be joining us. Uh, following that, we are going to be joined by Christian Ravukalaba, uh, Michelle Aguilera, and Javier Duran of the Confluence Center of the University of Arizona. Some of you may remember the uh, trailer we had here on Tumamak Hill for the Tales from Tumamak or Cuenta Memas project that we had, which was really trying to uh, understand with no assumptions, but what is that connection between people and space? Why do people come here? What is it that resonates with people? Um, that was a story core kind of storytelling project, which revealed uh, some really wonderful narratives and themes, health being a, a major theme that came out of that. Uh, so they're gonna be reflecting with us on, on a lot of the results from that project. 
And then we're going to be finishing the series uh, in December, really kind of taking approach looking at the desert diet. So this is a uh, health uh, community in nature from, from a distinct angle uh, and going to be shared to us with Chef Janos Wilder and David Boulay of New York City, who both of them uh, in their careers have really pioneered the use of uh, remarkable ingredients, but that really has a sense of place and using the, those that kind of the, that narrative of food to uh, both create wonderful, delicious food, but food that is good for you and, and really good for our community as well. So that's going to be a wonderful round out to our series. Uh, but to start us this evening, I really cannot think of two better guests to begin this series with in our conversations than Drs. Betsy Cantwell and Dr. Teresa Cullen. Uh, since March of 2020, I've had the fortune to directly work with both of them in the management of Tumamakil and all the ups and downs that we've had to deal with about managing the hill during the pandemic. Um, but throughout that time, I've been consistently impressed and inspired by their leadership. And we truly are lucky to have uh, each of them at the helm of their respective institutions, which eat both are core pillars really of our, of our community. Um, so I am very honored to be joined by them tonight. And I'd like to start by introducing and welcoming Dr. Betsy Cantwell. Dr. Elizabeth or Betsy Cantwell leads the Office of Research, Innovation and Impact. She's responsible for expanding the university's capacity for knowledge, creation, and discovery across a myriad of platforms. Dr. Cantwell joined the University of Arizona after successfully serving as the CEO of Arizona State University Research Enterprise, a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing the university's applied research and development, as well as ASU's Vice President for Research Development. Prior to ASU, Dr. Cantwell worked at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, and NASA headquarters in Washington, DC. She has a long career in space, space, space systems engineering, from satellite development to life support systems, and sits on the National Academy's Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board. She holds an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. Betsy, welcome. It's a real pleasure to be here, Ben. Uh, and, and hello to everyone who's listening, and uh, I look forward to this evening. It's um, a unique, uh, opportunity. Let me also at this time bring on Dr. Teresa or Terry Cullen. Dr. Teresa Cullen is a family physician and clinical information technician who began her career with Indian Health Service in 1984 as a family practice physician. And from 2006 to 2011, she served as the chief information officer and director of the Office of Information Technology for the Indian Health Service. In 2012, she retired from the US Public Health Service with the rank of Rear Admiral and Assistant US Surgeon General. Dr. Cullen went on to the work as the Chief Medical Information Officer for the Veterans Health Administration from 2012 to 2015. She later served as Associate Director of Global Health Informatics at the Regenstrife Institute, where her work focused on the use of technology to meet clinical needs and improve health outcomes in low and middle income countries. Dr. Cullen became the public health director of Pima County here in Arizona, here for us in May of 2020 to help guide the county through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Terry, welcome and thank you for taking on such an enormous task. We are so much for the better for it, so welcome. Well, thanks so much. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to serve Pima County and also to be meeting with everyone tonight. Thanks. All right, so let's get into it. The goal of tonight is to really take a step back and reflect on where we are in this new age of heightened uncertainty um, from so many angles, right? The pandemic being a large one, but as we'll talk about so many other elements. Yet, as we know, so much is driven by the current moment. Um, so I think maybe let's just start with where we are. Uh, the beginning of September here, transitioning from summer into fall, and I kind of hear from each of your perspectives on this. So Terry, if you wouldn't mind starting and giving us a quick overview, kind of help put the current trends into perspective of kind of where we are right now at the county or whatever scale you'd like to talk about. Yeah, well, thanks for that opportunity. Uh, when Ben first approached me, I said, let's just do this overview of COVID and get it out of the way because we know everybody is really interested in knowing what that information is. So I'm gonna give you a quick 
uh, prelude, a quick insight into where we are in the county right now. Uh, it may seem that all everything is COVID, all is COVID, what we do is COVID. Uh, sometimes at the public health department, it seems that way also. But what I'm going to do is just take you through where we are right now in the pandemic. I, I want to remind you, it's been a long time. It's been a long time for all of you. It's been a long time for our staff, a long time for all the frontline workers and the healthcare workers that are continuing to battle this disease on a regular basis. In terms of Pima County, where are we? We're not where we want to be. Uh, we've made some strides, but to remind you where we are, there was a time when we didn't have COVID, this may seem a long time ago, a time just a few months ago where we had less than 40 cases per 100,000 population. Remember, I was round to a million, that makes it easy. Uh, so it's 10 times 100,000. Um, right now we're at about 180 cases per 100,000 per week. So definitely four times where we were um, six to eight weeks ago. Not a great place. Uh, we, Dr. Garcia, who is the chief medical officer for Pima County and I go to for tat here about are we plateauing or are we not? Just suffice it to say we're too high. Uh, in terms of vaccination, we continue to do well. I always compare us to our neighbors to the north. Uh, we do significantly better than Maricopa County, but we're also still not where we want to go. About 56 percent of the population is fully immunized. If you look at the greater than 12 and greater than 18 year olds, we're at about 65 percent. Sounds like a great number. Still 35 percent of people should get immunized. And finally, if we look at our 65 and over, we do really have a success story there. 90 to 92 percent of people have had one shot. About 85 percent are fully immunized. Remember, if you can think back to the beginning of the pandemic, that's really important because that's where we saw a lot of our mortality early on. Right now, we have cases in the schools. We've quarantined over 4,500 kids. We've had about 35 outbreaks. We haven't, we've been lucky. We haven't closed any school totally. We've just closed some classrooms. From a public health perspective, we've done a whole lot. And I think Ben, in some ways, will talk, talk about this today in terms of resilience and recovery and what we've been able to put in place so that we come out of this in a better place than we were when we went into it. We've had lots of successes there, lots of lessons learned. Finally, from the clinical perspective, many of you may or may not have touched the clinical healthcare system. The healthcare system is in crisis. It continues to respond well. Tucson is full of an amazing, amazing group of hospitals, healthcare leaders, healthcare systems, providers, nurses, and everyone that touches them, including all the frontline workers that may not be specifically in healthcare. So overall, where are we? Not where we want to be. I think most of us were hoping we'd enter the fall, not where we are. But the good news is we've been able to respond once again to this pandemic and been able to, in a sense, overcome and at least address the boulders that are in our way. So thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. Again, starting to kind of see it with new lenses and again, try to adapt a bit to, again, this uncertainty here. So. You know, Betsy, from your perspective here with the university ramping back up to full speed, you know, just the buzz on campus, right? It's happening again. Um, I'm curious how you're managing the university's entire research program and architecture and kind of how you see this shift that is happening and how people are relating uh, to physical spaces and how, how that's morphing. Yeah, it's definitely morphing kind of under our feet um, as we speak and to go back to what Terry uh, pointed to as the need for resilience um, and the need to build in resilience. You know, we, when the pandemic started at the University of Arizona, we said research is critical. We've got to be able to create flexibility so that we're functioning um, at the, to the maximum extent we can. Much of research is people to people, whether it's medical research or field research or 
or even research on uh, on building a spacecraft, people are working together. So we created these kind of principles that were meant to be as adaptive as possible, support our youngest and earliest career researchers the most. They're the ones who could suffer the most from gaps in their capacity. Um, look at uh, our students and their ability to complete their degrees, particularly graduate students, but any student involved for whom the involvement in research is part and parcel of what they're going to do, um, provide clear guidance. So people conducting research know what to do, who to go to, where to understand as things change, and then make sure that everybody in the research world participates in the uh, testing, tracing, treating, a sort of paradigm of the university. So lots of things have continued to change and we established, we just sort of set up an operational construct that anybody doing research, whether they're starting something new or they're, you know, every month they're trying to understand what's the CDC guidance, what, what's community spread, you know, what is the county telling us? Um, we provide just a clear, uh, a, a, ability to understand what's going on, to put a checklist together for your research, to make sure that you're as safe as possible. Um, and all of that allows us to look at things like what's happening with the Delta variant and what's happening in the county. Do we need to shift up or down? Meaning do we need to make things more restrictive? Can we make them less restrictive? And can we give it uh, an approach that least impacts the ability to do research? What's for me, what's interesting about that to get to the second part of your question is that I've seen lots of our research teams really change their perspective on the physical space in which they're conducting their studies. Whether it's spreading apart or whether it's setting up 24 seven schedules so people don't come in as often, whether it's setting up cameras to look at instrumentation as opposed to going in and checking it yourself. Just a whole, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of adaptations have been developed to continue to conduct research of all kinds. And a lot of that has to do with teams themselves really rethinking their, uh, their physical space, or even the for field research, rethinking how they're gonna actually adapt the work that needs to be done to the physical requirements of, uh, of the space in which they would have done ordinarily done that work work that might have been planned three years ago, planned and awarded three years ago, now has to be conducted really very differently than it was. My approach to that and our approach at the university is this allows us to think about this constant state of change that you alluded to earlier. I believe it's a fairly constant state for some period of time um, as an opportunity to rethink our, not just our references to our research spaces, but our references to our spaces overall. We work in offices, offices that are far less occupied than they were. Um, we do our jobs in almost um, many, I would say 75% of the people who work for me and support research or conduct research do so in a very different manner than they did uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, all of that uh, says, you know, is our transportation is our impact on the environment changing? How can we learn from what we've had to go through as opposed to endure it? Um, and, and to come back to Tumamak, which is you know, a component of the portfolio of, of spaces that I have oversight of, is this an opportunity to scale or transform more people's um, ability to uh, interact with a, space, with, an, with a space like Tumamak? And I think I'll leave it there. I have lots of thoughts about, about what that means, but I do think we have um, something of an opportunity. One quick follow-up, maybe thinking about the opportunity. I'm just curious in the last 12 to 18 months from a productivity standpoint, mm. has there been a, a dip or I have to say from my experience here with the lab, this last year of working remotely was actually in many ways, one of our most productive. It really surprised me. I'm curious what you've seen, but taking the big picture. So if you look at a measure like how many um, proposals have been put in, or even the, the literal dollar number of the awards across the university, um, those have all gone up. Um, you can imagine, as I do, that people who go into a lifetime career of, that's really largely associated with research and teaching are there because of their affinity for the impact that their work has. And something like a pandemic really drives our sense of uh, needing to provide more impact. 
right. to, to get to these impactful points sooner, to train our newest generation of young people and young learners faster so they can help us get where we need to go. So I think some of that is an emotional driver that comes with being a researcher. And some of it is just the changes in, you know, we're in a little bit of a peripatetic world. You know, if you, if you work on Zoom largely, you're Zooming, you're interacting via Zoom a lot more often than I had regular meetings before. So I'm not sure that's a good thing, but we are in this change period of how we look at producing our life's work. And um, I don't know that that is going to be a new normal anytime soon, but we are seeing more product. What we would have measured two years ago and called productivity, we are seeing more of that. Is that healthy? Not sure. So, okay, switching gears a little bit, I'm thinking maybe making this a little bit more specifically about you two and the roles you're in. You know, each of you came in to your leadership roles in this time of change, right? Betsy, I think you had started maybe about a half a year before the onset maybe. of the pandemic. And Terry, I mean, as we mentioned earlier, you took the role several months in. So I'm curious how um, you each have kind of pivoted the challenges and new landscape uh, we are in since you've started your, your leadership roles and, and really how you're framing your goals and vision for what you're creating. Um, so Betsy, feel free to start. Sure, and I'll, I'll, I think what I want to do is kind of anchor us in maybe um, the, uh, and you know, I don't want to characterize this pandemic as a world of opportunity. It's, it's, it's not, it's, it's a world of, of, of uh, invitation to resilience as much as anything else. But, you know, so a university's, a public land grant university's role is to create knowledge, it's to impart knowledge, it's to create new knowledge, it's to create knowledge workers, people who have that knowledge and go out in the world. And, and we anchor kind of, we anchor not just knowledge, but innovation in any kind of community in which we, we live. So for us, it's largely Southern Arizona or the state of Arizona, or maybe the Southwest. Um, but, and, and so we, I look at the role that we play in terms of does this, you know, at least now, has this experience of the last year and a half enabled um, answering new kinds of questions or new uh, areas of inquiry? You know, at the same time as, as we have been dealing with the pandemic, we have also been dealing with uh, a, a, a frankly timely and renewed uh, set of really important questions about racial equity and racial equity in research is a very um, it's a fraught question because because the way research success has been defined the way you know tenure has been defined the way so much of the academy in the research realm has been defined is is by its nature inequitable um, so we right as the pandemic was declared and starting use the opportunity to come together at scale more via Zoom, meaning we could get a lot more people, quote unquote, in the room at the same time and ask the question, what and how do we wanna to come together around examining ourselves uh, from the research perspective in the realm of, of racial equity and racial justice? I mean, we were driven, uh, our community at least, uh, by the moment of the murder of, of Floyd, but that, I think really gave us an opening. And I will be doing a bunch of um, discussions really this fall in my Zoom-based um, conversations, which again, allow us to bring a lot more people to the table about what we've done in that year and a half. We've accomplished a fair amount. The point is that the, um, that the kinds of adaptations that we've made have uh, allowed us to do things at scale that we didn't necessarily have the capacity to do prior to this moment in time. Um, and certainly on the research side and in the, in the sort of research impact side, to go back to the people really want to make, make a difference and have an impact. We have used the moment to create scaling opportunities, partnering opportunities. We've been able to go global we, because everyone is used to this platform it, to ideate not that it's optimum, but we ideate a lot remotely now. Um, so it's really changing my perspective on what, um, what it is that we as an institution, what's our public good and how do we deliver that? 
Right. So, and then Terry, for you, you know, you kind of ran into the burning building, so to speak. Um, you know, I'm curious how you uh, respond to this. So I, I want to piggyback on where Betsy was going um, in terms of Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and I want to preface this by saying why I came to this job. Um, I interviewed in December. That was uh, I had actually just been back from China and I said to my husband, something's really going on. Um, we should pay attention. Not that I knew it was going to be this, but when I interviewed, my interview was based on a commitment from the administrator and from the county that I could come in to help create one of the healthiest counties in America. And that's why I came. I don't want to dispel any idea that I came to run a pandemic because I didn't. Um, and, and I happened to get thrown into that. Now, at the same time, just like Betsy talked about, the pandemic has created opportunities for us. It's also, however, highlighted the what we traditionally after Rita and Katrina and Ida called the underbelly of America and the racial inequity, the gender inequity, the social inequities, the impact of social political challenges. From a leadership perspective though, how did we manage in that time of change? You know, we, we've been lucky at the health department but we're responsible for one of the largest counties in America, over a million people, rural, urban, Donna, Tampasquayaki, everything you can imagine, the longest contiguous border with Mexico. So everything that can be a challenge is a microcosm within Pima County. We've been lucky from a leadership role and the commitment I think is from the lessons we are learning because I would not say we knew these lessons prior to the pandemic to be able to identify them, leverage them, create them, playbook them, document them, drive ourselves by data, publish the data, be audacious in our goal, never, never move from that commitment to say, we will be the healthiest county in America. Though I must admit this afternoon, I said to Mr. Huckleberry, I said in 10 years, maybe I get an exemption for the first year and I really have another 10 years coming. But I think to go back to what the pandemic has also taught us from a leadership is, you, you know, and when you have children, you learn this lesson, what do you control in your life? It can be a very small amount. What does science teach you? Science throws a curveball to you in this pandemic every time you think you are topping that hill and going down to the plateau, man, something else is coming right at you. The uncertainty, the continuity, the lack of continuity, and then you know, in some ways, the science, um, to go back to Tumamaki, it is about nature. It's about a virus is a living thing and it's mutating and we need to be able to respond quickly to it. So um, the other thing I wanna highlight is that the Board of Supervisors in Pima County in uh, November made the decision that racial and social socioeconomic inequity was a public health crisis. So in some ways we are privileged. We live in a county where, where there's lots of different opinions, lots of stuff in the news later lately that you all know about. But from a leadership perspective, we can talk about it. We can talk about justice. We can talk about what we want to achieve. And while there may be people that don't agree with that, we can have a dialogue. And in that case, we're pretty lucky. I kind of want to pull on a thread you mentioned there and ask an additional question here. When you talk about the role of, of science and the shifting nature of data, I'm kind of curious for both of you briefly, you know, how do you, so Terry, everything you do is based on the science, Betsy, you run a science enterprise. How have you seen the public's interaction mm. with science in the middle of a war on science, clouded by often poor communication of science? How do you see us navigating that space, both maybe within your direct experience, but maybe ma more macro as well? Um, either one of you, feel free to, to jump in. 
So I will uh, just briefly say my my perspective. So that's you know that's a um, that's a canonical wicked problem, right? It means it has many different vectors of information. It's unsolvable in the moment. It has to be sort of dealt with going along. Um, it's got a lot of components that we don't understand well, is to ask of ourselves as a community, both of scientists, but also of scholars. Um, and so we're start, so as an example of how I deal with that is we're starting a kind of a, a, an online um, fireside chat series about the impact of um, technology on the ability to disinform and the ability of disinformation to influence our civil and civic life. We have people who research many different aspects of that from social sciences and, and the data. And these are people who study the data to journalism. And these are people who study the impact of the word or the impact of the delivery of, of media um, to people um, in the com computational sciences who look at the underlying bot algorithms that create some of the disinformation that we're seeing to actual politicians who live in a disinformed world and try and create civic good. Um, so, so that isn't just um, how to understand science, but how to enroll our community in thinking together about the complexities. Um, and that hopefully results in each person who participates in that becoming um, better able to negotiate the shifting sands or the surf the wave, I often say, you know, it's a basically an endless wave. We have to be on the surfboard for a really long time. I, I think the other thing um, is the role of community. So, you know, the National Library of Medicine uh, promulgated this concept of citizen scientists. So I, I don't think it's just citizen scientists. Uh, for Pima County, it's residents. It's anybody who's floating through our geographic area or touching our geographic area. But the problem is people want certainty. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. I want certainty. I want to know what medicine I should take if I have COVID and I have to be in the ICU and what the setting should be specifically for the ventilator. Um, and what we have learned is remember, we are physiological beings. We are biology here. Biology 101, everything is changing. And we have to just accept that those changes are part of what we are doing. And we have to convey that. And Betsy, I, I really love what you just said. We have to convey that to our community. So when we, for instance, meet with an African-American community that is sponsored by um, churches, we may take a different approach than we would take with young Latin, uh, Latin young Latinx community. We're transmitting, we're hoping to transmit the same information, but we're doing it in a different format, a different way that can respond to what their needs are. But embedded in that for us at least, and this is what's caused a lot of um, the disinformation, but also the changing information yeah. is that things are changing and we're learning. And when we come back and we say, you know, we know, we. Th th I've had to do this so many times. I know three months ago, I told you that that is not what we're doing right now. Um, we have to be able to make that explicable in a way, in a framing that doesn't detract from the veracity or the honesty of what we're trying to do, but enables people to learn from it. And I think that that's the opportunity. The opportunity is to create more of an understanding, a deep understanding of science and data for every member of the community that we serve. If, if I could riff on that for a second, because I think one of the aspects uh, of what Terry's saying that's so important is actually giving people and our community permission to develop an, uh, their own understanding, it drives the desire to understand and listen and learn more than a, a sort of a, uh, this absolutist, you know, I, I actually think people believe they feel more, um, less anxious in the presence of certainty, but with aegis, with permission to become your own kind of scientist, the, um, the, the type of anxiety changes completely 
and um, and that willingness to um, to so willingness, but ability to feel more in control goes up very very rapidly. And we there's so many different methods we can use to do that, but in this shifting world, expecting that there is a kind of top down leadership in the world of science as opposed to here become in the city become part of the science um, enterprise is so much more powerful and it's a little bit different than um, than science has been viewed for the last few decades anyway thanks for your reflections on that and it kind of relates to the next, the next question here too and so one of the core elements that i've seen and experienced since the onset of the pandemic um, and you, you certainly have and those of us, those uh, listening as well, is having to manage and lead when there's great ambiguity, right? And this challenge flows across scales. I am thinking of parents deciding if they should send their children to school right now, um, up to decisions that affect millions of people and billions of dollars, right? So what have each of you learned and how to manage without having all the information at hand when a decision is needed? Um, Terry, let's start with you. Um, so, you know, I'm trained in family medicine uh, as a physician, which means I tolerate ambiguity really well. <laughs> um, because you've probably heard the statistics, okay, you go to the doctor and 90% uh, of the time, maybe they know what's wrong with you. And that other 10%, they know nothing bad's wrong with you. So you can go, but we might not know exactly what's wrong with you. So uh, from my whole training model in healthcare, I have tolerated ambiguity very well. I think the issue is um, to drive with the science you have, to not embellish, to not, never say you are certain, except on very few things. Sometimes I can tell you exactly how many classrooms we've closed because of COVID, but I probably couldn't tell you exactly why those classrooms got closed compared to somebody else and what we would have done differently in retrospect. So I think for me, at least through this period of time, it's understanding and tolerating ambiguity and trying to transmit that it is okay to be comfortable there. You know, ambiguity is a very uncomfortable place for the vast majority of people, especially in medicine. People, people want to know what's wrong. They want to know what to do. They want you to be able to tell them what to do, and they want it to be predictable. And our experience with the last uh, 18 months is that many of those things don't exist. So for me, it's being able to share with people that comfort I had as a family medicine doc, um, I, I'm okay with where we are right now. It, it's not ideal. We're still learning. And Betsy, th thank goodness, all this research is still happening. And all that research informs what I do. And in a sense, I do implementation science. I don't do basic research science, but I take that information and we try to implement that in the way we can, so. Yeah, Betsy, how do you approach this? So, I mean, in its simplest form in this, with this level of, of uncertainty or ambiguity, I give away all my power to, um, to the people who work for me and the people who, who I inform or my power informs, you know, in the, in the research world um, and, and, and listen, because, and, I, and I'm, you know, pretty uh, transparent and straightforward about that, that we don't have time to have certainty. So you go do the things you need to do, do the best job you can. I'm here to answer questions, but I'm really listening uh, for new knowledge that's coming up out of, and I don't mean necessarily even new scientific knowledge, but sometimes it is that it's, it's a new understanding of how we function. Just as a really small example, actually two examples, but one is we have a lot of people who worked from home could come back now, may or may not choose to. What's the data say about where we're good at this and where we're not good at this? And who? And it, often it may come down to who func who personally functions better at home, or personally functions better here in the office. And can can we create a set of uh, procedures that allow us to ask where do you where do you function better? Not what what are the sort of I don't know the HR rules. Um, 
one of the things that that le leads me to, because I know you're going to ask all, eventually about, about Tumama Kill, is we have been asking a lot of questions about our physical sort of built environment. What do we, what is this teaching us about kind of the unconscious ways we came to this environment. And now that we have to have some more consciousness, what can we learn? I think we actually have the opportunity uh, at, a, at, a, at a natural space like Tumamuk, especially with its incredible sort of length and depth weight of history. What is it that we can now learn? We have clearly not learned everything that we can from a space like that. And what this gives us is an opportunity to, act, to listen in a different, in a, even a different way um, about how a space like Tumama can inform our community. And I do the same thing. So that's my leadership lesson is I do the same thing with the people who, uh, who are listening to me is how do I listen to you? And what's your own native knowledge? And let's bring it all together. We have to operate quickly. We have to make rapid decisions in imperfect environments. That's what we're gonna have to do. Each of us has a certain amount of aegis. So let's dig into that a little bit more right now, exactly that. So I, I mean, I'm curious that the role that you each see for these natural spaces you're talking about, especially spaces like Tumuma Hill, or I'm thinking Sabino Canyon, but you know, the speaking about Tumuma Hill being here now, and this is our lecture series focusing there really, you know, where nature and community connect, right? And and I'm curious, what is it that you see? that clicks here in these types of spaces, spaces and should be prioritized and nurtured really um, as we move forward. So that's a let you just continue really. It's just a pretty seamless train of thought. Sure, and you know, I've, I haven't, um, I mean, Ben, you and I have talked about this a, a, a little bit. I think in it immediately what happens with historic spaces like Tumamuk that are outdoors is that it's such a relief to be there when being indoors can be stressful or either alone and operating in a non-social environment that's not very um, supportive or we're with other people thinking, should I have my mask on? Am I far enough away? You know, whether or not we need to, we, are, uh, we have a level, an additional level of anxiety being in our, in our and I'm thinking about our workspaces, our homes are probably not so much like that. So Tumamak begins to be uh, a, a, a respite for far more types of uh, feelings than it probably was in the past. Um, you know, and, and it, it seems to bear the weight of those kinds of things well. Um, but, but, but I'm not sure I have an answer to how does that intersect with, with Tumamuk's history, but I think it does. And the opportunity to go back to um, what does this remote world give us the opportunity to do in terms of scaling interactions is, are there, you know, I've asked this question, are there new ways to bring Tumamuk to people who may not be able to actually be here physically? Can we, um, can we imagine, and um, people who know me have heard me talk about my predilection for the graphical novel or the cartoon environment, which engages the mind in a really different way than the written word. Um, and and, in a, and you know, also in a very different way than being there physically. And it's kind of an, it, this intermediate two dimensional uh, space, but it's more of, a, of a, an experience than reading, uh, reading written words. Do we have an opportunity? I mean, this is something I, I present to you periodically, Ben, is do we have an opportunity to, to look at the impact, the potential impact of the desert laboratory differently now that we have both new tools and we have a different emotional uh, environment in which people are living for some period of time and we are in a world of pretty much constant change and adaptation? Yeah, one of the things I think in terms of the opportunities there is the, the, the invitation to experiment, right? It, yes, it's yes. Trying to crack that yes. and, and find those different connections. And it's kind of what you were talking about to Terry. Terry, I know that you come to the hill wearing so many different lenses and hats. You know, I see you on the hill hiking as well. And, but then also it is a, such a nucleus of our community gathering them. I'm curious, you know, what your reflections are on, you know, what are those elements that click here in this space and 
what can we focus and, and you know, strengthen? You know, the hell is a, a nature are very powerful, right? I, I think the hill for me, especially during the pandemic, and then you recall, we had the discussion, do you mask, do you not mask? What do you do? Do you close, do you not close? And so at that point, the, the weight of those decisions, knowing the potential impact of them on a, a broad swath of the community were, were critical and having that dialogue. But for me, um, and I think I may have shared this with you, but I know I've shared it with other people is, I, there are so many moments during the pandemic when the Hill reopened that I would walk up, think of walk up, walk down, and walking down, I would sob, I would just cry. Because to me, it was this incredible place where there was compassion and love and nature and um, an, an ability to be touched by, by, by what, is, what is Tucson, what is Pima County, on that hill, you know, children and families and culture and um, ethnic minorities. And, and it, it takes something to get up that hill, right? Yeah. But it's that real, for, for me at least, um, to go back to the Donatham role, it's a place of healing. It's a place of, of sucker. It's a place of support of compassion and um, humility. And I, I think the hill for me is that. And, and I do know there are so many moments in the last year that what the hill was for me personally was a place of release where I could go and um, put on my sunglasses and put on my mask. You know, you can, you can hide, hide on the hill though sometimes people really don't. <laughs> Aren't you that lady? Like, no, no, not that lady. Um, but you, you know that, that that ability to be outside and to connect with nature. And you know now, because of all the water, all the rain, plant it and it will rain. Yeah. It's this place of rejoicing. And so I think for me, the hill, yeah, I, you know, I get that there's a, a laboratory there, but I got to tell you, I don't really get it. I like, I don't pay attention to it. It's, it's much more <laughs> going up and down and seeing, um, yeah, and of connection. Yeah. Beautifully said. So many things at once. Um, and what, you, what I love about what you shared is that personal connection, right? That is irregardless of all these other layers that are here, right? The fact that this is a university space, that the laboratory is here, that it's 115 plus years of science, whatever, that there's so many other points of engagement to connect into that everyone has their own ways to engage. Mm -hmm. and, and then kind of what you were saying, Betsy, that's again, that area of the invitation to experiment of how do we kind of not change anything of that, but enhance or enrich the experience to reveal multiple other layers that are here. So switching gears maybe a little bit, kind of tucking, going back to something we touched on in terms of how you shared, how you each are kind of setting your goals and vision in this time. Um, I'd like to know even a little bit more specifically really about what your plans for the future and really how health community and nature fit into them. Um, so Terry, we, you mentioned earlier on, and we chatted a little bit about the county's resilience and recovery plan. I was wondering maybe if you could share a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I, would, I would love to do that. Um, I, I've learned recently resilience is a noun and that's how we're using it. Um, but I, I wanna just share with people some of the, the work we've done in this space. Um, it, it really is a natural, confluence of science and nature and the environment and the community and what we envision 
Remember, we do have this audacious goal, the most healthy county in America. Um, you can tag me on that in a few years and let me know how we're doing. But I, I, there are these essential components that we've identified that are really, uh, in a sense, embodied in the Hill, right? Community partnerships. That to me is what the Hill is. The Hill is the community and how I engage with the community, either as an individual, as a family, as a community member, as, as um, a rogue scientist, which is what I would call myself, not a real scientist these days. Um, that sense of health equity, communication and, and transparency. How do we make what we're doing at the county level transparent as we create uh, resilience and recovery in the community? And it's all embodied in a set of principles that we have developed that all of these will sound familiar to you. You know, quality, goal-oriented, data-driven, equity, accessible. Um, the one thing that I think that the hill brings that we've also really embodied is this whole concept of human-centered, human-centered design. Um, I, I don't know if a hundred or whatever years ago, people envisioned that the hill would have a human-centered design component to it, but it does because like I said, it takes us up and it takes us down and it enables us, you know, in some ways physiologically to process going up and going down, but also to let us do that with our spirit and our emotions and the other parts of our being. And finally for us, recovery and resiliency is about healing. And part of that healing is to um, identify the future, build for the future, share the future, teach for the future, um, really comparable to the work that uh, Tumamak does a lot. Finance for the future, because we know that that is a huge component of what we need to do. But at the center of all that, at the center of recovery and resiliency for us is really healing. And that healing to me, um, well, I don't bring out climate, I don't bring out environment here. They are all identified in parts of what we are doing as we heal with that recognition that we can't heal as an individual unless we heal as a community. And we can't heal as a community unless we heal in conjunction with the environment and nature and everything that's there. Excellent, thank you. I would just remind you all to start putting, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We're gonna we're about to get to that section of the evening, but before we do, um, Betsy, I'm curious, you know, so with the Desert Laboratory now under your leadership as part of the year old Arizona Institutes for Resilience, you know, I've had the opportunity to see how adaptation and resilience are really at the core of your thinking, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you're warranting kind of the larger scope of the university's research efforts. Yeah, um, so let's start with, you know, coming to the University of Arizona, really well known for a large amount of um, incredible scholarship in uh, climate change and what, what I would call climate adaptation, particularly our water work. So to me, resilience is the impact that we actually, it's the largest scale challenge and impact that we wanna have. If we can't turn everything around and go back to some magic past, which is sort of what the pandemic has also taught us, uh, a magic climate past, but have to, um, you know, and not just adapt, but really understand what is resilience. Um, and to, to pick up off of a couple things, Terry said, so it's certainly environmental resilience and community resilience uh, in perpetuity. So, you know, that has to last us hundreds of years, but also spiritual resilience. All of those become part, we can't talk about one with uh, out talking about the other. So we did take a large amount of the work that was going on at the University of Arizona and put it under this umbrella of the Arizona Institutes for Resilience, really putting resilience on the table as a hallmark. And that was meant to have health resilience, absolutely, part, you know, um, uh, look, bringing in agriculture and food resilience, bringing in engineering and looking at, um, looking at climate resilience from the perspective of uh, the engineered environment, both external and external. Um, I think I just said external twice, internal and external. Um, so how did the, you know, these complexities are growing? How do we 
create, and we've told our Board of Regents, we've told our governor, we've told our state, our goal is to make Arizona the resilient state. And that if you have been, if you're a lifetime Arizonan, which I am not. So as an outsider, when I see and experience Arizona, it's canonically driven to be resilient. Um, that can have good and bad outcomes, but that is really a hallmark culture uh, across the state from the top to the bottom. So, so when we do things like that and create this lens of looking at the entire, you know, the largest scale impact of the University of Arizona on our citizens is to enable resilience. Um, we also ask, how do we have global impact? How do we take that capacity to produce resilience in an arid and increasingly arid environment or a hot, increasingly hot environment um, and all of the things that those represent um, and are also really driving our, um, our global partnerships, um, both with similar areas um, like the Arava Valley in, in Israel um, is just an example. Um, we've, uh, we've, we've managed to snag um, uh, a gentleman who came to us from USAID who built over the last 11 years the perspective of USAID on global resilience. And so he comes with a global perspective on what does it mean to be resilient, uh, largely really climate and environmental resilience, but we give him the opportunity to say, what does education resilience mean for countries that don't have that capacity? What does health, global health resilience mean? And are really trying to do sort of deliver the knowledge that we create here uh, globally in a much more kind of boots on the ground, really with projects that are engaged in those countries. That's the big vision for resilience um, and, the, and the resilience lens. Fantastic. <clears throat> All right, I think we are at the point in the evening where we can open it up and um, hear from all of you in terms of what your questions may be. I think we have a first one here um, and I'm just gonna go for it. So, okay. So Tumamak Health Functions is a kind of a third space in the community, which is reflected in the diversity of the walking community. What do you think makes Tumamak Hill especially effective for building community and restoring walkers to a better state of mental health? Uh, Terry, maybe you can start us with that one. That's a hard question. Um, I, I think Tumamak, if we think of it from a spatially defined area, in a sense, it creates community because how, how wide is that road? I should know because John and you put those tracks on there, Ben. <laughs> Forever indebted to your husband. <laughs> but, but there's a limited space, right? There, there's a defined limited space. There's, we talk about this a lot in public health. Where's the rumble strip? Where's the guardrail? There's guardrails already there naturally. Well, not naturally, but they're there. Guardrails of nature. People abide by those guardrails to a large extent. So I think in some ways community is created because of Tumamak, because of the close proximity. It's also, you could theoretically walk up Tumamak and never look at another person, but I imagine that would be pretty hard. So there's this kind of innate humanness I think in the connection and in the process of walking there. And I, I will defer the, the science to you guys, but I think from a community perspective, it's become by default a, a, a gathering place. And it's a gathering place where people meet for multiple different things. And obviously people have their different motivations for why they're parts of it. But I think that the default is that people come to connect and that connection could be to your partner who you're walking with, to your child who you're pushing, to the desert and the saguaros, uh, to the top of the hill because you wanna look out over at a mountain or the rest of the community. But I think that there's this innate connectedness that's part of it. Yeah, 
That's would you like to add anything? Yeah, although I might go a little bit met metaphysical on you, and um, which isn't necessarily the weight of data and science, but um, but but walking up and down Tumamak Hill is not the same thing as going to the gym. Um, it's not just done for uh, the sake of exercise. So in that sense, it's much more like a meditative act. Um, and so many people have done it that the mountain bears, the, um, the energy, the meditative energy. And if you've ever been in a like 2000 year old Buddhist temple or any place where meditation has been the major act for a long time, it, and I don't care what kind of a scientist you are, it's sort of like absolutely palpable. Um, and I think that happens for people who, and, the, and I think this, you know, the, the identification of the hill as a third space is really right on in the context of not only the, your personal meditative act of walking up and walking down, but the, um, the amount of, of, of metaphysical energy one way or another that is there that you receive as you do that. And so is that, is that scientific? No, but it is an absolute gift to our community and the people that get to walk um, to have the ability to get all of those things at once. So to meditate, to be around other people, to exercise, to um, receive energy. Um, that uh, is, you know, the, because of the number of people over history that have walked up and down to Mamak Hill for whatever reason, it, it really defines it as a unique physical space. Absolutely. Uh, great perspectives, both of you there. Thank you. And, and I'd add to that question that that's a lot of what we're trying to get at with this series. So um, each of these different events, the, the four collectively are each going to be taping different perspectives, exactly really that question. So um, right on, on point. Now, so next question here is, you know, this is from uh, Gina Murphy Darling, who's been very supportive of AIR and, and has a great uh, series of podcasts um, that I was able to participate on, on Mrs. Green's World. And she's curious to know if there are uh, any of the work that we putting a spotlight on pandemic research. Uh, is COVID an anomaly or does research suggest that we've only just begun? Cool. That's a Terry question, but I will say we are creating multidisciplinary centers focused on not just the not just COVID-19 and SARS like viruses but but the whole if you will the pandemic experience and how we prepare for other such experiences in the future where really the the um the medical biological integrates with the sociological and the physical space here's what i found <laughs> My watch thought I was talking to it. It happens periodically. It's a big fan. Oh, yeah. It's actually it's telling me what metaphysical means. Um, <laughs> you know, my fear is that COVID's not an anomaly. Um, and that, it, Betsy, to follow up on what you just said, that one of the most important things we can do right now is to document what we're doing so that it can be, uh, this is the scientist in me, the applied scientist in me, so that we can go back and look for early sentinel Here's information that will enable us to be better prepared next time, uh, as well as help guide us next time. When we, um, we, we, we talk a lot about it, playbooks in public health and there was no playbook. There should have been a playbook. This is not the first epidemic we've had. H1N1, hantavirus. I mean, I, I lived through, when I was the medical director at cells, I had five epidemics in five years. Um, but there's, there wasn't a playbook. There wasn't the information available because it hadn't been collected in a way that was then, um, that, that could easily be queried and facilitated and then documented and then reused. And so in that way, I think that there's this huge opportunity as we go forward for us um, from a pandemic research perspective to 
learn and to gather and to figure out what really made a difference. And to follow up on this metaphysical thing, because Betsy, I love that. I was a philosophy major. Um, but, but, but the reality is that those are those other components that are so critical for us to document. And in some ways, they're they, they border on the intangible. They're, they're not, I actually don't believe they are intangible, but that ability to um, query, to document and query that information, I, I think is what's going to be needed for the next time as we go forward. So two things. One, that's why graphic novels are so cool is because they bridge the thought and the physical, and you can have it in, in and you can have it in one sort of enduring form. Um, the others, we actually have a new research program that's part of the Aegis Initiative, which is really looking at pandemic responses called Sentinels, that asks the question, you know, in a in a in a geeking out sense, what are the sensors that and, and what are what does that mean? What you know, is it a physical thing? Is it, where's the data coming from? What are the methods that we would not just query it, but learn from it fast. Do we need AI and machine learning? Do we not need that? Do we need partnerships in other countries? How do we put all of this kind of data flow sensor stuff together with understanding what, when we don't know, when we're entering a new pandemic, how do we, under, how do we most rapidly deliver new knowledge? And, and let me follow up on this, I, this a second. Um, and it's related to nature and related to the hantavirus. So I worked in uh, American Indian Alaska Native communities for most of my career. And in the middle of the, in the early parts of the hantavirus, when young people were dying, this mm -hmm. is about nature. Some of the older Navajo medicine people said, I remember a time like this. And it was when there were a lot of acorns. <laughs> and if we had just listened then and said, oh, right, because what happens when you have a lot of acorns, you have a lot of rodents, and you can go beyond that. So Betsy, it really is that ability to have multifactorial connections, documentation, mm -hmm. listen, listen to all those people that are those scientists out there, all of us, pull all that data together and be able to evaluate it in a really quick way. So. Yeah, hopefully we'll be listening more to those, <laughs> those men. Um, a related kind of question here, you both meant, touched on this a bit earlier, this gives a bit of opportunity to dig a little deeper, that there's such a great divide when it comes to marginalized communities and the impact of climate change and COVID. Uh, where do we even, where do you even begin to thoroughly systematically address the inequality, the inequities when it comes to very large institutions where creating sustainable shifts can be quite challenging? Do you see a way forward? Um, so you, you guys talked on that a little bit, but this, you know, can give you an opportunity to go a bit deeper. Um, go you know, I think I talked about some of that. I mean, certainly large universities like ours are in, intractable and very challenging to shift. But, but there are probably three components to doing it. One is, is just verbally opening wide the aperture for permission to talk about it. Because if we're not, if we don't have permission and our entire community is not at least talking about it, it's gonna be really hard to get, get anywhere. The second is, you know, institutionally, my job is to, is to seed research. And so we've created unique seed funds very specifically to encourage our researchers to begin to create coherent, fundable research programs around this question of, of um, equity, either in, in uh, climate mitigations that are available and but only to certain components of the community or, um, or health equities. So we're really asking the question, how do we use the monies that we have to stimulate our youngest faculty and students to begin to have permission to ask questions about equity uh, and climate equity in ways that they didn't have permission if all they did was look to whatever the existing funding sources or, or, or whatever the existing mechanisms were to get their research questions funded so they could begin to develop something in, in, the, in the name of new ways of looking at impact. 
there's so the, and I only said two things, but though, you know, our, our, and in a big institution, we have pluses and minuses. We move slowly, but we also have these, I won't call them pots of money, but I have, I have capacity to open the aperture if I want to, and I do. So I have the capacity to say, you have permission to ask these questions. I will, I don't have the answers. I don't certainly have quick answers, but I do have capacity to help you get there. And I think for us, from a health perspective, obviously we're paying tremendous attention to the climate and climate justice. And we actually do a lot of work with census tracts and we've overlaid a ton of heat data and um, natural vegetation data onto the census tracts. And lo and behold, it's not surprising, right? Our census tracts that are most at risk because they're, um, they have what we call SVI, a social vulnerability index that's over 0.5, are places where we have huge heat disparity. I mean, some 10 degrees heat disparity in certain parts between the foothills and other parts of the community. Um, we, we looked at this uh, because of cooling centers. And if you, um, and I think the county's done a great job, but if you, Look at, for instance, just where water is available for free. Um, it's much more available in the north part of the city than in the south part of the city. Um, so I, I think for us, uh, looking at climate and climate justice and knowing that um, to go back to um, Betsy, once again, this metaphysical, what value does the hill bring is, is how do we create an environment that allows people to seek solace in their backyard or in their park down the street and to connect right away there. And at the same time, you know, there's lots of dialogue going on about um, viral mutations and the impact of um, West Nile and dengue fever and other things like that related to heating and changes that we're seeing. So we expect that the climate justice component of this will become increasingly critical. Un unlike, however, what Betsy has is pot of money, um, you know, there's a very small pot of money federally from a health perspective in terms of climate. We're seeing it more and more in the current administration has talked about throwing money into that, but really there's a need to do a lot more, not just research, but if we once again go to applied and implementation science, what, what, what makes sense to do? What gives you the most bang for the buck in the next, um, for me, let's do our 10 years, in the next 10 years, what really should we be focusing on in terms of climate? And, and even how do we know that? How do we know what, not just what to do, but how are we measuring sufficient to understand that the steps that we take <clears throat> will make a difference? And I, and I say that because so much has been done, for instance, putatively at least in the name of racial equity that has simply not worked. It hasn't moved us far enough or fast enough or sometimes at all. Um, so for climate justice is, is really an important question. Climate mitigation is a huge area where there will be a lot of funds thrown at things. Are they gonna make it worse? Are they gonna make it better? Or are they, how do we, how will we know? I do think this is a really ripe area for beginning to think about what, what's the data gonna tell us and how do we create the systems so that it's, they are producing the right data. And I'm just thinking about in a local level, all the opportunities of collaboration between your two institutions, right? These projects that can be begun at the university, but then be applied in a real world sense, leave that academic side bridge over and have that applied real world impact. Um, I know it's happening, but I think it, you can just see that level up. Another question here um, talks about, so St. Mary's Hospital, our neighbors for 115 years, uh, thinking with the Tumalak Hill, is also a place of community health and healing. Um, I'm curious what, so the question asks, what efforts could you see that could be made to make a closer relationship to be supportive of the Hill as a public health resource, uh, mm. particularly for the people in the immediate surroundings? I, I think, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times our conversations with the hospital have been focused around parking, right? That's the last thing we should be talking about. We need to be talking about uh, really what this question gets at. So 
um, either of you would feel free to start with um, thoughts of inroads and and honestly, I will, whatever you say, I want to act on it because this is an area that's just totally ripe for collaboration. It's got to be a Terry question. I mean, if it's <laughs> oh, it's so of... hard. I I, I would <laughs> say that the one thing the thing I always remember is the day in the St. Mary's parking lot. This is a decade ago. There must have been fifty javelinas, and I thought, oh, I wonder if they're going to get yelled at for parking here. <laughs> <laughs> parking their javelina butts in the parking lot. You know, uh, uh, Ben, what you're saying uh, and, and, and what the question bespeaks is, I mean, the immediate place where I go is, what's the opportunity to, to engage with St. Mary's and ask the very specific question about the potential health benefits of the Hill? You, you have to be prepared that the answer could be you have to scale some access, for instance, or mm -hmm. do something different. Um, but but that is their business and that is your business. So there there is a, just a clear overlap uh, that allows a, a, a limited set of engagements around a really critical issue. They're right physically next to one another. How do we take advantage of the health benefits of the hill for the for the community and the clients of the hospital? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, and I think actually it. Um, it, it's a challenging question and you should challenge the health department with this question. So thank you for asking it. I don't know the answer to it uh, because I, I think it's not only just St. Mary's, right? Um, yeah. There's multiple healthcare workers that walk the hill. You can tell, you know, in their scrubs, they're from uh, other facilities. And what is the, how do we imbue that commitment to not just public health, but transforming the health of the community through this access, this gorgeous, amazing access we have to this hill. And once again, as Betsy says, it's not like working out in a gym. I mean, there's a whole milieu, a whole um, construction that goes around being, being part of the hill and part of the hill community. So. Ben, I, I don't have the answer to this. I, I've thought of this multiple times that, um, and not, not only that, I would say the community that surrounds mm -hmm. the hill, the, the people that live within half a mile of the hill, um, what, what, what's that commitment? What is that mutual commitment between the hill from a health perspective and the St. Mary's and, other things, as you know, we did um, some vaccine clinics right at Pima County West. We did a lot of advertisement at Tumamoc that was highly successful. You know, we had people come to Tumamoc and we're like, oh no, go, go get vaccinated, go over there when FEMA was here. And we worked a lot with that big shopping center, you know, okay. the, that, that's there. So there's a huge opportunity there. Um, it's probably a great research project mm -hmm. that could be done, but a lot of, potential impact there. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking everything from prescribing nature to to kind of more detailed. I, just a historical context maybe on this topic is that at the base of the hill exists actually the oldest uh, and first private swimming pool in Tucson built by Godfrey Sykes. And when he built it, he uh, the most frequent users of it were actually the nuns of St. Mary's Hospital um, and their patients. So. There's, there's some good precedent here. Wow. So anyway, I appreciate that question. And I think it's a, an area that's ripe for, mm. for important conversations going forward. Okay, let, let's kind of close on, on a question that trying to, you know, again, looking forward, putting our best foot forward and, and seeing where, and I'm curious where you each are drawing inspiration from um, and how that may relate to a lot of these things we've been talking about this evening about what one can connect to here in this natural space, this community space, this cultural space of Tumamak Hill. So if that's how you take the first crack at it. Um, so a very personal answer for me is, you know, my entire youth, and I think of that as before children, um, was really this combination of living outdoors, uh, mountain climbing, rock climbing, hiking, you know, 
being completely away and then building satellites, right? So this sort of dichotomy, which I didn't have time for after I had kids. And now that my kids are out of the house, I have, and I'm, and I am unfortunately a lot older and not able to do physically. So, so I, I get to re-engage with the, uh, with the, the world outside of the indoor world and outside of the technical world with a very different body. Um, and it actually requires of me. So just as an example, if I were pre-children and ran up to Mamak Hill, uh, that's just not even a, a physically available action for me at this point. Um, I, I have to move slower. I have to think differently about how I'm, you know, am I, am I, am I, taking care of my physical self at the same time as I'm engaging outside. If, we, if my husband and I go hiking, uh, I can't hike 20 miles a day anymore, but I can, and so that changes my entire uh, perspective on the value of the uh, uh, natural world. To, to me personally, my internal self is mitigated through having a, a new approach and I'm not being negative at all, but having a very new approach, having a different physical self with which to engage. Um, and that changes my spiritual, uh, what, I, what I receive is really quite different um, than it was when I was a lot younger. Um, it's hugely valuable. I mean, it's really amazingly um, important to me to be able to have that quiet place. I was, this summer I was in one of the old growth components of the forest in Washington state. And you walk in there, right? And you can feel it immediately. First of all, it's really quiet. It's everything's hushed and it's like the weight. Um, and, and where I might or in, a, in a younger life have moved really quickly through that and had this phenomenal experience. I had to, you know, basically look at all the ferns and see all of the details uh, that I wouldn't normally have noticed. So that's a very personal perspective, um, which has informed my, my work life uh, throughout. Um, as you can hear, I am a very technical, very data-driven, um, very science-oriented human who receives kind of a lot of my spiritual uh, knowledge from being alone in the wilderness. That's wonderful. Thank you. Terry, how about for you? Um, well, this is always a hard question, right? Um, to, as you know, my husband and I, we might not know this, but my husband and I just did a backpacking trip mm. to the Sierras for a week and I hurt my knee and I had to slow down. Mm. And we were going to do those 60 miles and instead we did 30. And um, it was when the forest had closed, so nobody was there. It was, it was a gift. It's a total mm. gift for mm. the universe. Mm. Um, of solitude and um, really compassion, in my opinion, because I hadn't had any time off in a long time. But I, I think I was struck, um, first off, I was struck by the, the Milky Way and Betsy, I'm sure you, you'll you love this, that went from one end of the sky <laughs> to the other of Rochelle, Soldier Lake. And I was like, oh, if I was Holy an astronomer, moly. I would just throw an arrow and spend my whole career in this one inch because there's so many stars there. But um, mm. the Mary Oliver quote always comes back to me. What will I do with this wild, precious life? that I have. And um, I think living through COVID, um, fe feeling COVID to my core, I, I feel like COVID is part of my being. Um, and the incredible sorrow and pain and suffering that has occurred. And then, um, and I'm gonna go back to Tumamak and then when I, when I talk about going down to Mamak, walking, I, you know, it's interesting, I never cry going up probably because I can barely breathe, but going down to Mamak and just having this, this primal release of what does it mean to be here? What does it mean for my feet to be connected to the earth? What does it mean for me to be able to look out on what's there? Um, I, I, I think that that's what gives me hope in a sense that um, we will get out of this because it's been a really crappy 
period of time. And yet there is, as Betsy talked about, as you talked about, and as I talked about, some, some there's magic. And we just have to be able to remember how to connect to that. Yeah, magic in the butterflies right now on the hill. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you too so much for your time and for your leadership. I, I really appreciate um, both greatly. And thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, while we can't be together in person yet, we hope to see you here on the Hill and, and with us again next month. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone. Stay safe. So, so.